Biscuits, the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 162, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Lorian Carsey and Shea Balahi of Blue Moon Farm in Urbana, Illinois, raise vegetables for farmer's market, restaurants, stores, and a CSA. With 20 acres dedicated to vegetable production and 10 high tunnels totaling just under half an acre of year-round production, Blue Moon Farm was founded in 1977 by John Chernus and Michelle Wander, and now Lorian and Shea are in the process of taking over the ownership and management of the farm. We dig into how Lorian, Shea, John, and Michelle are all managing the nuts and the bolts of this ownership transition, including ownership structures, roles in the transition and how they figured those out, tackling farm life balance issues, and the challenges of managing employees through this transition. We also discuss their homemade customized CSA program, which includes meats and eggs from other farms, a complex crop rotation that keeps 10 acres of the farm in a combination of long and short-term cover crops, and the ins and outs of managing a diversity of high tunnel sizes, shapes, and technologies. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by High Mowing Organic Seeds, the first independently owned farm-based seed company proudly serving professional organic growers with a full line of 100% certified organic and non-GMO project verified vegetable, herb, flower, and cover crop seeds. Highmowingseeds.com slash farmer to farmer. And by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com and by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. Lorian Carsey and Shea Balahi, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having us on. Really excited to have you here today. So, I'd like to start off by having you guys. Give us the lay of the land there at Blue Moon Farm. How many acres are you guys farming? What kinds of things are you growing? Where are you located? And all the details like that. Okay. So Blue Moon Farm is here in Urbana, Illinois, East Central Illinois. We are on 20 acres of certified organic prairie land. Um, we grow only vegetables. We don't have any livestock. We sell to the local Urbana farmer's market. We sell to some restaurants and we sell to a couple of our local stores that feature uh, local produce. We also have a CSA and along with that in our CSA, we have a feature to the CSA, which is sort of a customizable CSA where people don't even have to participate in the CSA program, but they can order a box of whatever they want. And then in the winter time, we have a winter market, which is not a CSA. It's either a market, people can show up at the market and buy stuff, or they can show up and pick up their prepaid customizable box. And marketing in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, you say East Central Illinois, and I, and you know, I'm from Wisconsin, so we have a thing about Illinois, but, but. <laughs> So tell me a little bit about about what that market's like, because I would think that Central Illinois is not exactly a hot spot for organic vegetable farming. So I think in general that's true. We are in the middle of a vast corn and soybean world here, where it tends to be very rural. Except that we live at the town of the University of Illinois, and we have this really wonderful little bubble of people who care about local produce. And it's actually, in terms of the farmer's market, it's a great farmer's market town. Like there's huge support for that market here. We don't, I do think there's a divide between the rural and the, you know, the country mice and the city mice. And we get a lot of support in town. And then it is true that there aren't a lot of markets around Champaign-Urbana that we could go to, except for, of course, Chicago. So we're in this this great little bubble of people who do who do want locally grown produce. So you said you said twenty acres in in vegetable production, and then you guys also have 
a lot of high tunnels as well, right? So we have 20 acres on the property itself. About half of our acreage is in cover crop at any given time. And we also have 10 high tunnels. So all of different sizes. So it adds up to, you know, about 17,000 square feet of high tunnels. Some of them heated, some of them not heated. We have all different types of high tunnels and different conditions in the high tunnels. And I mean, that that lots of different kinds of high tunnels, I think, is is the result of how long your farm has been around, right? Yes, exactly. It really reflects the history of, of so the farm was started in 1997 at this present location by John Chernis and Michelle Wander who Michelle Wander is a soil scientist at the University of Illinois. So when the farm started, of course, there weren't any high tunnels on the property. And so slowly we've been adding since then. And uh, our most recent high tunnels, which were built in 2008 or nine, are 30 by 90. We've built two 30 by 90 high tunnels um, and we have a range of sizes from smallest to the 30 by 90s. And of course, if we could do it all over again, we would just build a couple of really big high tunnels and try to connect them. But we have this, you know, funny mismatch of of sizes and shapes. And, you know, some are double layer, some are single layer, some are really long and narrow. And it makes planting this, you know, mathematical puzzle each year because you got to figure out how you can fit the same amount of tomatoes in different size houses. It is kind of funny now here in 2018. I mean, high tunnels are like completely standard farming equipment, but back in 1999, that really wasn't the case. And, and in fact, I think at that point, a lot of the high tunnels that were being built were much smaller, longer, skinnier units than what, what we standardly run into now. It has over, you know, over the years working with the high tunnels, it's really brought home that the bigger, the better, like the more automation, the better, like all of that stuff pays for itself. And having, you know, tiny, tiny, really cold houses very much limits what we can do in the winter. Like really the only things that we can grow in the winter on in those tiny houses are spinach and some bunching greens. And what other crops are you doing in the wintertime in the larger houses? So in the larger houses, we have one of our larger houses is heated by a multi-oil burner. So this multi-oil burner is a really great heater, and it allows us to um, really try to keep that house at around 40 to 45 degrees at night. And in that house, we have a lot more options. So we'll grow parsley and cilantro and bok choy, salad greens. We try to grow a little bit of a diversity because that's kind of our backup in case if those if we have those crops in other houses, but they they get a lot of cold damage in the other houses, then we have them in the main house in order to provide the diversity that we like to provide in the wintertime. So in that in that main house, most of it is salad greens, but we do have small amounts of these other things that we try to keep alive just in case they don't stay alive in the other houses. And so are you producing out of the high tunnels all year round? Yeah. So we have our high tunnels in the summertime is where we do our tomatoes and peppers and we do some okra and some beans. And then in the wintertime, we convert those to about half spinach and then half salad greens, bunching greens. And then I want to circle back real quick to something that you said earlier, which was that the farm was founded by John Chernus and Michelle Wander. So why am I talking to the two of you? (laughs) Go ahead, Jay. Oh, so John Chernus has been the primary uh, farm manager for, well, since 1997. And he he just wants to retire. He's he's done farming. Um, he's you know destroyed his body and ready to move on. So, um, Lorian's been with Blue Moon Farm I think for about fifteen years, and he kind of approached her about the opportunity of succession. And Lorian didn't want to run it by herself. 
she wanted a partner. A couple of years ago, I was running my own farm. I had my own farm for about three years. And John Chernis reached out to me about an opportunity. And I thought, well, the worst thing that happens is I say no. So I went and met with them and was pretty much presented with a dream. So I ended up taking the job as uh, assistant farm manager with Lorian. And we're in the process of succession. So transferring the farm to, to Lorian and I. Um, so yeah, so that's why you're talking to us today, Chris. So when you say transferring the farm to Lorian and I, what, I mean, are you guys actually talking about transferring the ownership of the, the business and the land and the machinery and, and the whole nine yards to you guys? Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're in the process of purchasing the farm from, from John. Yeah. Everything, the land, the, the machinery, the packing shed, pretty much, you know, the business, everything. I know because I, I sold my farm a number of years ago now, but that's a lot. I mean, that's not, it's not your typical beginning farmer enterprise to go out and buy a going concern of a vegetable farm. I mean, when you look at the balance sheet and all of the assets that are sitting there, I know that that number is not small. <laughs> it's not, no, it's, it's pretty overwhelming. We have frequent meetings with John about transfer and, and the different possibilities and the challenges with it. And yeah, how are we going to possibly pay for this giant operation? Um, so there's, there's a lot of meetings and a lot of different, different things to think about when you're transferring ownership. And so let me just ask that, I mean, to be pushy about it, how are you guys going to pay for this? And, and are you guys organizing this as a, as a business partnership then that's coming in and purchasing this from, from Michelle and John? So, What's happening right now is that we have become, Shay and I have become members of the LLC that John and Michelle created in 2010. So the way the business is set up right now is that we are 50% owners of the LLC and we are pretty much renting the entire farm operation from John Chernis. So currently we are, you know, we're, we are farming Blue Moon Farm as the LLC, Shay and I, but what we actually own is very little. And the, the process of purchasing the land, the machinery, and the buildings, that's a long-term discussion. We are looking into FSA loans. It's a whole exploration that is going to take a long time to figure out because as you said, this is a huge operation and we don't have we don't have the funds personally to to just, you know, straight up buy it. So we're not sure exactly how it's going to unfold. I mean, it, it could be a situation where using the profits from the farm, we just slowly buy the farm piece by piece from John and Michelle starting with tractors, going into greenhouses, and slowly make that transfer. But it's, it is not a simple process at all. It's not, you know, like a contract loan or, you know, a simple transfer. It's really a complicated accounting puzzle. Just, you know, just the LLC itself in terms of all of the different pieces of equipment that the farm owns versus all of the different pieces of equipment that John owns that we're renting from him. All of these things, it's, it's, at, it's just adding a new, it's kind of like going to accounting school instead of going to farming school in our spare time, we're going to accounting school to try to just to try to make sure that this transfer happens in a way that's fair to all parties and that is economically viable to all parties. Do you guys have help with the negotiation process here? Or is this something you're just tackling between the four of you? I have gone out and tried to, um, get some consulting from the outside. And all of that consulting, what it revealed to me is how much I have to learn about the process and how much more help that, that, we, that we need. So probably the next step is to actually pay for lawyers and accountants to give us real advice and some real, you know, some real concrete information in terms of forecasting for the future and how the loans would be structured yeah, we're, at, we're really at the beginning stage of understanding how the farm ownership process would, would happen. In terms of transferring the LLC, all of that, that's, 
pretty basic and straightforward. And, you know, that, that, that part makes sense and it's already pretty much done. But then we really don't want to get us, ourselves into a contract that, you know, at the, at the end of 20 years, we realize we made, you know, there were so many mistakes and, you know, loopholes that we built into it that don't make any sense anymore. We really want to do it right. And I think we do need help. I think one of the really hard things about about trying to structure a deal like this, and like you said, trying to be trying to be fair to all of the parties is really that, you know, like when you go out and buy a house or even when you buy a piece of farmland or a, pe- a single piece of farm equipment from a tractor dealer, there's a process that happens there. And it usually doesn't have a whole bunch of of what I might think of as social imperatives laid on top of it. Nobody's trying to be fair, right? The deal is you're trying to, you know, you're trying to get as cheap of a tractor as you can get. And the tractor deal is trying to get you to spend as much as they can get. And, and if they're going to give you 0% interest, there's a darn good reason that they're giving you 0% interest. And it doesn't have to do with the fact that they want to see young farmers succeed in the business. They just, they're, it's just a way for them to make money. And, And I think it, it really is interesting when you start to layer in kind of these other considerations that you've talked about on here. Yeah, because currently we're all farm partners. We're all of us are working together. We have this common goal that that John's investment, his work, his sweat equity, you know, what he has created, he gets to be fairly compensated for and that the farm is successful enough that Shay and I get to have reasonable, you know, reasonable jobs and reasonable lives until we have to retire. And so we all want the same thing. How can we all get the same thing? It's not, it's not a clear picture. It's not, it's, it's not like we're each trying to figure out how to get the most out of the other person. We actually all want everybody's needs to be met in the situation. And so as you go, as you go through this negotiation process, I mean, it must be kind of a challenge to, to invest the time and the energy. And it sounds like you guys are already investing money without having the whole deal worked out and even really knowing for certain that everything's going to work out in this transition process. Has that been a little bit of a scary process for you guys? You know, John is really good about every step that we take. He's checking in and saying, are you still, are you both still willing to step forward? You know, every step of the way he's, he's rechecking in to make sure that we're still committed to the process. Um, Is it scary? I, you know, my husband works for the U of I, so um, I have a really great cushy husband job. So it's a little less scary for me. I'm, this is the job that I love and I am pretty much in it no matter, no matter what. I mean, I guess not no matter what, but I'm, I'm pretty much dedicated to it. So I'm very much like, let's go forward, let's go forward. Um, but I think Lorian's story is a little bit different. Well, yeah, I mean, I, it is absolutely it is definitely a scary proposition in that I'm supporting a family with my job and there is a strong, you know, in this country, given the fact that unless you are connected to an institution, you're paying out of your pocket for your health insurance and your retirement and those costs could be going up all the time. So it is, I have, when I'm, as I'm making this decision, I'm, I am constantly trying to, to make sure that at the end of the day, I'm going to have provided a reasonable job to support my family on. The positive side of that is just that Blue Moon Farm has been around for so long. We have such a steady, good market here. We have really stable sales. You know, John has created a sustainable, successful farm. And theoretically, if we can just keep it going, keep it alive, keep it, you know, keep learning, keep improving, 
the risk of the farm failing and then we're all, you know, we're all poor and on the streets is very low. So, but I will say there is, you know, there is so much, there is so much money and investment involved that it's not a thing to be taken lightly at all. It's kind of like adopting a child. Like it's a huge, it's a huge investment. It's a huge risk. It's just in that there are, you know, there's no one to back us up if it does fail. And that definitely is, I think, with a with a business that's 20 years old, by my count. I mean, yeah, you've you've certainly got a, a business system in place, but there are there's still risks to, especially to owning your own business, because it takes you outside of much of the safety net that we actually do have in this country. You know, things like unemployment insurance and and things like that. When you own your own business. Those aren't there at all. As I was, as I've been going through this process of of buying the farm, of looking at the profit and loss statements, at the balance sheets, you know, the list of the list of properties that we have, you know, all the different tractors and so forth. And I think about all these farmers all over the country and all of the self-employed people all over the country, and realizing we ask so much of this of people who are self-employed here, and that. There, there's such a, there, it's such a risk. Like there's, there is no safety net. Like all of these people, how are they paying for their health insurance? It's a conversation that I really want to have. Like the amount of dedication and self confidence that it takes to, to build your own business and say, you know, if this business wins, I win, and if it loses, I lose, and. And no one's gonna, you know, no one's gonna pick up the pieces if it fails. It's it's, a, it's just a really interesting set of conditions that farmers are in here. Now, Shay, you said that you owned your own business before you came to to Blue Moon Farm. What prompted you to make that change? Like, what was more appealing about coming and being involved in this farm transfer than continuing to run your own operation? Wow, it's a long list. Um... So, yeah, so I had my own farm for three years. My first year, so all three years, I didn't own my own land. I live in the city. I rented land, small parcels of land from two different um, landowners. And when I say small, my first year was a quarter acre. My second and third year were around an acre. And all of the pieces of land that I was renting from were not great for diversified vegetables. So my first land piece was on a conventional um, parcel. In the second and third year, I was renting from Prairie Fruits Farm, which I think you know about Prairie Fruits Farm here in Urbana. There's a goat farm. So I was farming by myself. I was trying to do everything. I was trying to, you know, manage everything, send out emails, make sure there was drip line by myself, put in stakes for tomatoes and tie them by myself, you know, a lot of different things. And I needed to get the soil to be better. Um, So it it was just this constant struggle. My husband wasn't seeing me. It was just a big struggle in our house. And we both, my husband and I both had goals about what we wanted from the farm. So when John called me um, and I had an interview with, Lori and Ann John and you know they were saying hey we get off work at five there's employees you'll have you know you'll you'll be making hourly wage you, you um, there's going to be a potential of farm transfer all of these systems are already in place um, it was very appealing and it was really nice my husband stepped back he did not give me any input about what he what he really wanted me to do. Blue Moon Farm was everything that I wanted to be. And I could still live in town. My husband could keep his job. We wouldn't have to move. You know, there was a lot of pieces coming together. So I decided, I was like, yes, this is exactly what I, what I want. Um, And, you know, in the interview, I really tried to talk John and Lorian out of hiring me for the position. You know, I was a young farmer. I'm still a young farmer. I don't know a lot. And I was really worried that I was going (laughs) to ruin the farm. But, but they, they still 
they still hired me and my husband was very thrilled that I made that decision. So yeah, there was just a lot of pieces and, and I'm really happy um, to be at the farm. I, I was kind of, you know, it was very much a dream come true to be wanted for this position. So yeah, that that's pretty much the story. So it was really a way And I think this is a possibility that I think is oftentimes overlooked when people are looking at how to get into farming, but this was really a way to kind of jumpstart your farming career by being able to get into a place where the markets were established, the soils were established, the systems were already there, and you could just go and and farm rather than having to go and, and build everything from the ground up. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you know, the first year for us was really hard and we learned a lot of things and I am still learning every single day about new things, but, um, and we're, and we're improving systems. So it's, yeah, it's, it's given me a way to really learn about the process of farming and rotations and why do we do certain things at a certain time? Um, and it's, it's really been it's been helpful. Have you been able to make your own mark at Blue Moon Farm? Does Blue Moon Farm, as it exists here in February of 2018, reflect something of, of Shea Bellahy? Or does it, is it still kind of the, you know, Lorian who was there for 15 years and, and John show there? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of both, which is great. Um, I when I came in I really wanted to do this idea of our online customizable CSA thing um and I built that from the ground up um our, our built our website um and started that program but we're trying to still expand that program so that's that's a little bit of a reflection of myself be it good or bad um but something that Lorian and I have built that is a reflection of ourselves has been the CSA. John did a CSA long ago, but um, kind of dropped it off. But, but Lorian and I have restarted that program. And that's, that's kind of a reflection of, you know, of the new age of, of she and I taking over and growing the farm and the possibilities. So in a lot of ways, it is still a lot of John and Lorian reflection, which is great because they've been there the longest and they know a lot more than I do. So, you know, it's nice for me to have little pops here and there, but, you know, if I come up with an idea or get excited about something, they, they reel me in, which is great. It's really been great to, to bring Shay on after John and I working together for so long and having, you know, having our own way of discourse with each other, ways of making decisions, and we have a kind of a groove in how we communicate and how we talk. And one thing that's been really great is to have is to bring in somebody after all these years who doesn't fit in with with our style and is often able to point out glaring discrepancies or, you know, ways that I will, you know, agree with John or disagree with John that make no sense that are just based on our past history. So she's kind of like a fresh, like, you know, a fresh breeze through through John and I's relationship. And and that that part has been great. She she is, for me at least, she's my anchor in terms of all things having to do with the website and social media and things like that that I just I don't have a really strong background in or interest in. And so it's been great to just be able to throw problems at her just call her at any time and say something's going wrong with somebody who ordered this or that on the website, but their order isn't going through. Can you go and take care of it and fix it? So, you know, part of part of why we brought Shay on is that as John was stepping back, I was looking at the workload of of running a, you know, twelve month out of the year, twenty acre vegetable farm and realizing that there was that there was just no way that I was willing to do what most farmers had to do in order to start their farm, which is to work 16 hours a day, every day, 
except for Sunday, maybe. And that for me, family life is incredibly important. I have a nine-year-old son. I didn't want to look back and say, I chose the farm over being a mother. I really wanted, I really want to be able to have a strong family relationship <clears throat> and be a farmer at Blue Moon Farm. And I knew that I couldn't do it on my own, especially as John was trying to push off more and more responsibility for day-to-day -day management and then also responsibility for farm planning and, you know, really just, just wanting to take a, a full step back. I realized that there was just no way that I could, that I could have what I think of as a successful life on my own. And Shay is, Shay is the answer. Like, there's no way we could do this without her. It's just so important to be able to, to share, to share the load. And so it's, you know, the farm is already, the farm is already such a juggernaut of work and tasks that it's not like there's any room for someone to come into the farm and say, hey, let's just start this whole new operation because we have extra land or we have extra time or we have all this extra money. The, the farm the farm is already just so full in terms of all the things that we need to get done that the thing that Shay, Shay was able to add specifically, which is her willingness to take on this project of having an online sales presence, you know, that's really been huge and something that there's no way I could do or John could do. And then, you know, Shay, the other thing you have to remember is that you took over that Saturday farmer's market. The Saturday oh, yeah. farmer's market, as as we all know, like these farmers markets are crucial in terms, well, for us, the farmers market is crucial in terms of our sales. And it's also a life killer. Like you, you know, you, you work all week on the farm and then you also give up your Saturday getting up at 4 a.m., which means that Sunday, Sunday, you're just recovering from what you've done to yourself all week. So it doesn't actually, it doesn't actually serve as a day of rest for a day of, you know, having a life. And so, so Shay took over running the farmer's market, which, which really saved, it really saved John and I. So she's, she will, she might downplay, you know, her role at the farm, but she saved the farm because there's no way I could have done it. And John was saying, I'm not doing it anymore. So Shay saved Blue Moon Farm. Way to go, Shay. <laughs> that's that's a lot of credit that Orion just gave me. <laughs> take it and run with it. I say take it and run with it. Um, yeah. So tell me a little bit about how you guys divide up the jobs on the farm. Who who has who has what roles in the operation? Um so I so what do I do? I am the farmers market manager. I am I start all of our seeds and manage our start house. I do the social media presence. I'm the packing shed manager, so do a lot of managing of washing, um, what's going where, and um, yeah, the online store and the CSA. I think I do a lot with the CSA as well. Um, yep, so that's, oh, I do the bookkeeping. <laughs> Bookkeeping is a big thing that I'm mm. I'm trying to get better at as well. So my role at the farm, I I I started at the farm in 1999, and it started as a as a part time field hand. I was um I was actually studying poetry with a local poet, and had always always been interested in farming. I took an organic farming class. I always had a garden in college and I needed a part-time job and I saw an advertisement for Blue Moon and I started um, just working as a part-time field hand and farmer's market person and I absolutely loved it. And I, I thought this is the right place for my energy. This is a really pleasurable, beautiful, um, tasty job. And I, 
immediately upon my second year doing that, John, who is a master delegator, started trying to give me more and more responsibilities in terms of being the person who does our weekly green seeding and our lettuce seeding and doing a little bit of harvest crew management and things like that. And so I, I worked at the farm for five years during that time and grew and grew in terms of what I was responsible for and in charge of. And then as I was doing this job, it dawned on me that and I'm talking, you know, this pod- podcast is going out, out to lots of farmers who will understand when I say that, oh, farming is hell in some ways. Like farming will, if you let it, will take up all of your time and energy and you will have no other life. And so at the end of five years, I said, John, I love this job. I love this farm. I love this work. And I've got to go get a real job because Farming isn't a sustainable way of life. The way that I was watching him do it and the way that I could see it would become for me if I kept going. So I took a break and I went to grad school and I lived in Venezuela and I did all these other things. And then I came back to Urbana in 2009 and John said, hey, would you like to come back to Blue Moon Farm and be the winter farm manager? I had missed farming and missed that life so much while I was gone. And it was a big decision to go back to Blue Moon Farm and it was an easy decision in that I it it was in me. Like everything about the farm was so familiar to me, like the landscape, the feel of a tomato in my hand, like the sound of the tractors, like the wind, all of it just really called me back. So from two thousand and nine on I've been I've been the farm manager. And so what that means today is I'm in charge of all of the um, all of the planting, all of the bed prep, all of the harvest, all of the day-to-day operations of the farm that make sure that crops are seeded, crops are planted, fertilized, cover crops, bed prep, and harvested. So, so we, I mean, it's it's hard to say like how the farm is exactly divided up in that we we're all sharing responsibility for a lot of things, and so a lot of what my job is bleeds into what Shay's doing and what Shay's doing bleeds into what my job is. But for the most part, I'm acting as the operations manager. So I'm in charge of making sure that everything happens in order to get the crop from seed form into a marketable product that goes to market. Now you were just saying that that the uh, how farming is something that it it can really take over your life. I mean, the farm is something that will take everything that you will give to it, and then it will ask for more on top of that, unless you put up some limits. And that and that that's how John was running the farm before you came back in two thousand nine. What changes did you guys make in two thousand nine when you returned to the farm, Lorian? So. Yeah, when I returned to the farm in 2009, I was a single mom. So, John, as a single mom, I was not able to do everything that I'm able to do now. And the main thing that John wanted of me at that point was to give me the winter time because you know, in the winter time it's our opportunity to to rest, to go to conferences, to read books, to not be a farmer for 16 hours a day. But at the same time, we have these 10 greenhouses and they've got to pay for themselves. And there's such a huge opportunity to produce food in the winter because not many people are doing it. So when I came back in 2009, his goal was to simply give me this job so that he could stop doing it in the winter and to develop it. Like his, you know, his winter his winter cropping was was pretty basic, mainly because he just didn't want to invest the time and all of the details of, you know, which beds sh- should be planted in what, in what, and what are the temperature profiles and all the pests and diseases that come in winter and so forth. He wanted to hand that off. And then as the years went by, I was slowly able to shift more and more responsibility from not just the winter, but also taking over in 
in the summer as well. And so that meant taking over the weekly work schedule, taking over the harvest plan, taking over the feeding schedule, hiring employees. Slowly all of that farm responsibility over the years has been growing such that actually last year was last year was the, the first year that Shay and I became full LLC partners and and really was the first year that John took a huge step back and let me and Shay really take over the farm to the extent of doing the farm planning, doing the crop, the cover cropping, doing all the sales and marketing, making all the major decisions. And his role now is really to fix things when they break and to tell us when we are really screwing something up by not, you know, getting out in the field and cultivating that, that, you know, that carrot crop right now when the carrots are two inches high and the weeds and the weeds are just germinating. So from 2009 until the present, it's been just a slow transfer of all of the all of the decision making and all of the all of the work tasks from him to Shay and I. And did you also make quality of life changes in terms of how the farm was being run when you came back in 2009? Was that was that part of the package or are things still kind of manic? So from my perspective, we work too much. So from my perspective, we should be starting work at seven and leaving work at four o'clock. And we should not work on the weekends or the evening. And currently, we start work at in the summertime. We leave at 5 or 5.30, and then there is some evening and weekend work. And to me, the farm, that's too much. But I know that when I look, when I hear about other farms and I read about other farms, I realize that that's really a pretty well, like that's a pretty good schedule. Like we're pretty lucky to get away with that. I've always tried to be really strict about having family time in that I don't come home from work and then spend two hours on the computer doing a newsletter or I don't come home from the farm. So we live off the farm. John and Michelle have a house on the farm. Shay and I live in town and I try to be very strict about coming home, getting clean and then being with my family. And and when I when I look at that, I realize that that is, in terms of farming, that's a luxury. It's a luxury that a lot of farms don't have or, yeah, I don't know. But it seems like a luxury to me in that I when I, I hear about how other people have to farm and it's just not, it's not like that. From my perspective, it is a, it's a situation where you have to, you have to draw those lines. And you have to decide when something isn't worth doing in order to have quality of life. And I guess I'm not really answering your question in terms of structural changes in that, you know, both John and I had a common goal of having of having a reasonable life outside of the farm. Even with the addition of Shea, I think we're still trying to figure out what that balance is, because as you, you can always make the farm better. You can always do more research. You can always get out there and weed more. So, I mean, I guess the one structural change we made is that we used to start the farm at 6.30. So now we start at 7, unless it's going to be really hot, in which case then we'll start at 5.30 or 6. But really starting, the only structural change I was able to make to make to reduce our hours was to push that 6.30 time up to 7 o'clock. But it does sound like simply that being able to walk away from the farm at the end of the day, go home and take a shower and switch your focus. I mean, that's a pretty substantial adjustment right there. I do, you know, as I'm sure everyone listening to this relates, after a full day of farming, it's kind of an illusion that you're going to have quality of life at the in the evening. After a full day of farming, you come home and for me at least, I'm 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 clean, but I'm exhausted and I'm I'm just trying to keep my eyes open so I can log those family hours until we go to bed at 9 p.m. And it's, you know, I don't know what to do about that, really. 
like I don't know how to make farming currently less physical and less exhausting. <laughs> now, it's been really great this year because the winter time for the first time since I've been back has actually been somewhat of a break in that we've had some really cold weather and um, our family has been sick and um, and Shay has been here. So the combination of those factors is that there's simply been less to do that we could possibly do at the farm because it's been somewhat shut down. And I've actually been forced to stay in bed for several days. And then I've had to, my other family members have been sick. So I've been staying home with them. And I feel like this is the first winter where I've actually said, wow, this is what it's like to have some time where I am not physically or mentally at the farm getting things done. And it's been, it's been wonderful. Like, oh, this is why people don't farm in the winter. Because you really need this break. With that, we're going to stop here, take a quick break, get a word from a couple of sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Lorian Carsey and Shay Balahi from Blue Moon Farm in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by High Mowing Organic Seeds. When your livelihood depends on the quality of your seeds, be confident in your investment. When you grow organically, you need to know that your seeds were selected to perform in organic conditions. High Mowing offers professional quality seeds grown by organic farmers for organic farmers. Visit High Mowing online to request a free copy of their 2018 seed catalog, read about the company's mission, and browse over 700 organic varieties including tried and true market standards, all new high performance hybrids, and beloved heirlooms. Use the code F2FSEEDS, that's F, the numeral 2, F seeds, when you purchase online, or mention the code when you call to receive a 10% discount on purchases of $100 or more. Visit highmowingseeds.com slash farmer to farmer or call 866-735-4454 to get started. The podcast is also brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but it is truly a superior piece of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability that every farm needs. I have worked with BCS tractors for over 24 years, and I wouldn't consider anything else for my small tractor needs. And I am not the only fan. More than 1.5 million people in 50 countries have discovered the advantages of owning Europe's most popular two-wheel tractor. And these really are small tractors with the kinds of features found on their four-wheeled cousins and a wide array of equipment. Power harrows, rotary plows, flail mowers, snow throwers, sickle bar mowers, chippers, log splitters, and more. Check out bcsamerica.com to see photos and videos of BCS in action. bcsamerica.com and we're back with Lorian Carsey and Shea Balahi from Blue Moon Farm in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. So something that I found interesting is that, that this farm was founded in addition to by, by John Chernus, who we've talked about quite a bit, but also by Michelle Wander, who's a soil scientist and, and has been a soil scientist for a long time there at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And I'm curious how having a soil scientist as one of the farm founders and as part of the, the team there has influenced your farm's development and operations. Having Michelle on hand is a really great resource. Um, we are a lucky, we are very lucky here in central Illinois that our soils are so great and so rich thanks to the prairies here. So we don't, we don't really have a lot of problems in terms of organic matter and all of the right nutrient levels, like we are pretty lucky here. At the same time, she is a great resource in terms of things that are going on, latest research at the university. She's on hand for consulting. I've brought her into the to the greenhouses where actually the soils are a little bit more difficult to manage in the greenhouses because we don't get, you know, we don't get the rain that we do outside and we don't do much in terms of composting and adjusting that way. So I've 
I've definitely brought her in to, you know, look at why is this going on with my spinach on, you know, the edges of the beds. I've got this condition going on at the edges of the beds and this condition going on in the middle of the beds. And she'll point me to resources online. Um, and she will, she's a great consultant. So yeah, that's been, you know, that's been great. And just being right next to the University of Illinois, with all of their ag research, that it is a great resource. I noticed on your website that you said that you have 10 acres of cover crops and 10 acres of vegetables. Tell me a little bit more about how that rotation works on your farm. So we use cover cropping as our main source of fertility on the farm. We don't do composting. We don't do manures. For the most part, we can rely on our cover crops to to provide the soil management and the and the nutrients that we need. We do we are a really diverse farm in that because of because our main our main marketing is at the Urbana Farmers Market, we really want our stand to provide a lot of diversity of crops for our customers. Which means in terms of crop planning, we have so many different crops going into those to these 20 acres at any, any given time, all going in at different times throughout the season, that our, our crop planning is really a, it's just really complicated. So we have all these, you know, we have all these spreadsheets with rotations forecasting out for the next 10 years of where each, you know, each individual block what's going into it, what's coming out of it, making sure we're providing as many seasons as we can between crops that have particular soil needs and particular disease pressures. But we really believe in, or we really, cover cropping is a great strategy for us. Like it really provides, it provides all of our needs in terms of, you know, making sure that we're not overusing the soil, making sure that we're putting, you know, we're getting enough fertility for our crops, like cover cropping is a, is a, is, that's how we manage it at Blue Moon. Are you doing a rotation such that you're one year in cover crops and one year in vegetables? Is that, is that how you're kind of moving things back and forth on that 20 acres of production? No, it's not that straightforward. So, you know, each block is managed differently. So sometimes we will have, we will have a certain percentage of the farm that does have a perennial, you know, perennial cover crop for a year. But so, yeah, a certain portion of our farm is always in a long-term cover crop. And then other blocks on the farm are constantly being um, short season cover crop and then planted into and then short season cover crop and then planted into. And then that block will try to take out and put into a cover crop and let it rest for a year. But it's not exactly like a one-to-one thing where you know, each block gets one year on and one year off because of the amount of crops that are needing to be cycled at any given time. It's it's a little bit more complicated than that. This part of the farm planning where we are deciding what, what the rotation is, this is really something that I'm just now getting into. In the past, John in January has handed me the farm plan and said, this is how the farm is going to look. I need, you know, we need cover crops planted in this field and this block at this time. And my job has been to execute that. It is only, it is only now that I'm actually starting to get into the part of planning that out and reading about all the different cover crops, which ones are annuals, which ones are perennials, which ones are for are like quick growing to keep weeds down, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that part of the farm has always been in John's hands. And so it's only now that I'm actually starting to get into that aspect of farming. It's got to be really interesting to be taking that knowledge, which is so, I don't know what the right terms for it is, intuitive, networked, um, you know, it really is, it really is something that I imagine that John has, for lack of a better word, a feel for. 
and try to translate that for somebody else to take over that system that doesn't sound like it's it's not a particularly cookie cutter approach. I think it is. I mean, I think to some extent it is it is mathematical in that there aren't that like when when I when I look at that rotation schedule and I look at that farm planning it's actually much more constrained than I would have thought. I would have thought, oh, there's 20, that we have all this land. So, you know, we can put solid mix wherever we want, or it'll be easy to find a spot for these potatoes. But actually, given that we want to space these crops out for so long, given that different blocks have different soil conditions, we have some blocks on our farm that are, that are a little bit wetter and heavier. And we know we won't be able to get in there in the spring to be able to plant into there. So we have to tend to avoid putting our, you know, our spring crop. And there's still that being on this small plot of land with all these different crops, with all these different conditions and the weather, it's really, it's actually very constrained, that rotation schedule. And so one of the things that John has been a wizard at is record keeping and actually writing all this stuff down. So that's something that I'm so grateful for is that I don't have to start from scratch. I don't have to reinvent the wheel on a lot of this. So he has tried to take all of that intuitive knowledge and put it down on paper so that we have so many more tools when we're trying to make decisions about about what we want to do on the farm. So that part makes it really easy in that, you know, he does have a feel for things like he'll say, wow, it's, you know, the beginning of February, have you checked field, you know, F to make sure that this isn't happening? And when that happens, that's when I'm the most frustrated because I really, I really want to have, I really want to have all of the knowledge on paper so that I have no surprises, which is of course impossible in farming. Like there's always going to be surprises. You can't control everything. Um, but for the most part, I'll say he's tried to make that part of farm planning and crop planning, he's tried to make that a transferable set of concepts so that we don't have to start from scratch. With 10 acres of vegetables, I mean, you guys obviously have employees. How does, how has the transition of, of farm management and therefore employee management worked on the farm? Has that been smooth or has that been kind of a bumpy road? It's nothing, it's, it's not going to be, it won't be new when I say learning how to create systems on the farm in which employees are able to know what's expected of them and how to get the results that we expect of them, that that is not easy. And that is, there's never enough attention that is paid to, to getting our employees to do what we're doing pretty much to learn how to set up a job so that we're not micromanaging to learn how to set up a a structure that people know when they're doing the right thing and when they're going off course so that people can self evaluate so that systems are visible it is not at all smooth it's um it's very bumpy and we have a lot to learn about it. And I'm, I'm really excited for this next season because after last season, you know, Shay and I just had, had so many moments where we're standing there saying the, you know, the, we're drowning in, we're drowning in details. The truck has to leave for deliveries. We've got to have everything ready for market tomorrow. And we're standing and watching people do things that make no sense given the, you know, the goals that we have and what we have to get done. So how are we going to structure this so that we are actually helped by our employees and don't feel like we're doing it all ourselves in spite of the fact that there are six people on this farm who are supposed to be helping us get all these things done. And, you know, sometimes we feel like we're just running around constantly checking up on people and, and, so I'm making it sound like it's you know it's totally crazy and chaotic. We do we do have systems in place. They just they just need to be better. They need to be more visible. They need to be more obvious. 
And, you know, one thing that I, that I keep coming back to as a farm manager is, is I've got to trust that people are capable and they want to do a good job. And if they're not performing that, it is my responsibility to create the conditions under which they can live up to their potential as great workers. Nobody coming to Blue Moon Farm comes to the farm and, and just wants to, you know, not do a good job. Like they all want to do a good job. Shay and I have to create the conditions under which they can do what they want to do, which is make the farm successful. To add to that, coming from, for me, coming from a farm that I was the only person on, it is really hard for me to make the transition of, I have to stop and make everyone do better or go quicker or work more efficiently instead of me, Shay, has to do that job faster so that we can get the truck out the door or we can get to market and I can go home and actually eat dinner. I am just in the mode of, I am the fastest person at this. I'm going to do it right now instead of stopping, looking at other people and making them more efficient. So, you know, one of my goals this year is definitely to take a step back and do a better job of evaluating other people. Um, so it is very hard for me to make that transition to farm manager. Um, and it's, it's always something that I'm, that I'm working at and that Lorian is encouraging me to, to do better at. And has it been a challenge to transfer the authority for employee management from John to the two of you? Um, yeah, it's interesting that you would ask that just in, you know, Shay and I, Shay and I talk a lot about, about our role as managers. And we do a lot of comparing between our role as managers and John's role as a manager. And that, you know, managing employees is, has to be one of your number one concerns. And so we do, you know, we do a lot of like, how can we do this better? And why is it that it seems like John, John is able to get, John is able to, um, John is able to lead the farm in a way that we struggle to come into leading the farm in terms of our employees. And I think a lot of that has to do with experience, having this sense of, having this sense of knowing what absolutely has to get done and how it absolutely has to get done that he has. And I think it has to do with feeling like an owner. So the more that Shay and I actually grow into this role as this farm is our life, this farm is a vital part of the community that we are leading, I think the more that feeling of authority and leadership at the farm will will just happen naturally. Ever since, you know, my second year at the farm, I, I was a crew leader and I was, you know, in charge of making sure like this individual task was getting done with my group that I was leading. I've always had, I've pretty much always had that role. I think I'm pretty good at being able to identify, you know, how to train people in terms of doing individual tasks. So that part of it, I feel really comfortable with in terms of really feeling like, okay, this is my farm. This is Shay and I's farm. It's our job to create tasks and systems that make the farm successful. I think that's something that we're still growing into. Shay, I want to circle back to something that you talked about at the beginning of the show, which was the online ordering system that you put in place for CSA members and non-CSA members. Could you tell us a little bit more about the program that you developed there and how that works? Sure. So, yes, yeah, so we have an online store. Um, we call it our customizable CSA where people can go online and choose um, products 
in the summer it's each week and in the winter it's bi-weekly products that they want and that they will um you know that that will be secured for them and then they come to a site and pick it up that also includes other farmers so we have a collaborative um with david bain from bain family meats in our farm um there there used to be more farms included, but right now we're just focusing on those two. And so it's a great it's a great opportunity for people to get vegetables, meats, eggs, all in one place at one pickup. So we're really targeting people who are real busy and they don't have time to get to the farmers market, or it, it's a long drive, or you know, especially in August when when school starts. People are driving their kids to gymnastic practice or soccer on Saturday mornings, can't get to the market, but they could swing by after work and pick up their box of vegetables, meats, and eggs to take home and have, you know, have for the week. Um, so, yeah, so that was developed to give people a little bit more flexibility than a locked-in CSA box that we choose for them. Um, we do two site pickups, one in Champaign and one in Urbana. In the winter time, it's it's one in Urbana. But yeah, we're looking to make it more of a success than than what it is right now. Again, I'm a, I'm I'm a farmer. I'm not a marketer, so it's really it's really hard for me to market things um, and make it grow. But is that something that you built using a a platform that you purchased or is the online store something you built from scratch? So yeah, we built, we built it using WordPress and different plugins. So it was, it was an already built system through a piece of software, but there was still a lot of building that was, that was necessary. It took a lot of, a lot of hours to do. The, the online store not only gives us the opportunity to sell other people's products, but it it also links to a payment system that splits it between the vendors. So we don't have to deal with David Bain's payments. They go straight to him, which was why we specifically chose that piece of software. Um, so that makes it very easy for us um, to have other vendors be included and work work together. When you talk about the idea of a of a customized CSA box or custom packing pre-orders, that feels like a lot of work and a lot of potential for for things to get screwed up. Can you talk a little bit more about how that actually works at a nuts and bolts level on the farm once you've received the order? It does leave a lot of potential for, for screw ups. So what we've done on the back end of the program, particularly for vegetables, is we create tags for each vegetable that allows us to set up our, our pack out line with the heaviest items on bottom and the lightest items on top. So when we get orders, those orders set will automatically sort with the heaviest items first and the lightest items on bottom, um, which makes the pack out really easy. We get, we get it, well, we have to make these invoices for each customer, it has their name, their order, their, you know, their date and information on the product that we hook to their box. So when we send people out to the world, or our employees out to deliver their boxes, they have names and their order already um, packed up. And that can include me too. So we try and keep it together so that our employees are less confused about what's going on. Um, yeah, so we set up a line. I am I am very um, protective of the CU Farmers Program and it not being messed up. So I kind of do it. <laughs> I should train somebody to do it because it's ridiculous for me to do it. But I'm very particular about um, the the boxes being correct. If the boxes aren't correct, then I personally am usually running products around to different people to correct the issue. So I want to make sure it's right so that I'm not um, I'm not having to do that on my what's supposed to be free time. 
And so when you talk about making sure the boxes are correct, what do you do if you've got employees packing the boxes? Are you standing at the end of the line, double checking the order? When we wash the items, we pack it not into their boxes first. We pack them out for the cooler. And I want those products to be packed separately. And I want those counts to be right. So if there was 12 arugula, I want those arugula in their own separate box that say 12. So if I'm packing out the CU Farmers boxes for each person with an employee and we get to the end and there's two arugula left in that box, I'm looking at that employee and saying, something happened. We have two arugula left. There was only 12 and 12 were ordered. So where's the mess up? So we go to each box that had arugula and look and make sure that the counts in that box are correct. So that helps eliminate any issues um, or it helps me cue like, oh, something must be wrong with that arugula if there's still some in the box. So it's almost like a double entry accounting system and making sure that everything yeah. balances at the end. Exactly. Exactly. Do you like how I tied that back in to you taking over the accounting? <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, with that, we're going to stop here, take a quick break, and get a word from one more sponsor, and then we'll be right back with our lightning round. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company, helping plants make sugar from sunshine since 1992. You know, in the wild, where our crop plants' ancestors evolved their microbial partnerships, plants are provided with nutrients from the soil through the work of partner microbes that they work with. Wide-ranging roots reach an abundant supply of nutrients and microbes, even in less than ideal conditions. But now you've gone and stuck that seed in a tiny little container in your greenhouse, and it has to get everything it needs right there in a few cubic centimeters of soil. By providing compost-based potting soils, chock full of microbial partners and humus-bound nutrients, Vermont Compost ensures that your plants have what they need consistently. If they're not in the ground, your plants deserve to be in Vermont compost potting soils. And you deserve the peace of mind that goes with knowing that they are reaching their full potential while they're there. Makers of living media for organic growers since 1992. VermontCompost.com. Shay, what's your favorite tool on the farm? I would have to say my favorite tool is QuickBooks. Um, it really guides everything, at everything we do on the farm. We have to look at at QuickBooks and all of our records to see what we're planning for for the next day, week, hour, all of the above. So I'm, I'm going with QuickBooks. And Lorian, how about you? My favorite tool on the farm. So when I think about, when I think about the, the tools I use the most and that I need the most and I feel the most comfortable with, I would be thinking about our little international 274 tractor that's you know, lightweight. It's got thin, skinny tires. We use it constantly on the farm. We can cultivate with it. We can dibble our holes for our salad mix production. We can set up the flamer on the back of it. We can pull trailers around the farm with it. I've got to say that's like, I feel like that's my right hand, my right hand tool, my right hand man. Right. It's just always, you know, it always starts, it always works, it's easy to understand. So that's my favorite tool. <laughs> and those are three really important qualities in a tractor. Always starts, yeah. always works, easy to understand. I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shay, since you're in charge of the packing shed, what's your favorite crop to wash and pack? I kind of, I kind of like doing the radishes. I hate to say that because Lorian hates the radishes, but... They're really, you know, it's the first thing in the season that comes up that has so much color and they're beautiful. And it's the last thing in the season that has a lot of color and it's beautiful. So it's, it's just that thing in the beginning of the year that I'm like, oh, it's, you know, everything is returned and it's the, the brilliancy of vegetables are back. And Lorian, what's your favorite crop to grow out in the field since that's your area of responsibility? I would have to say, there's, I mean, yeah, as you said, Shay, that is a hard question, and I really get the most satisfaction and pleasure out of the tomatoes. I love how they smell. I love how they taste. I love how they feel. They're just, there's so much 
you know, there's so much richness and variety and good food to be made with tomatoes. They're just really a satisfying product. And are you guys growing all of your tomatoes undercover or is that a combination of indoor and outdoor production for you? Oh yeah, it's indoor and outdoor. So we, we like to have our, our shoulder season, our spring tomatoes out of the greenhouses. It's hard to find good greenhouse, good tasting greenhouse reds. So we have our outdoor production of tomatoes is really where, to, to me, it's like that's where the most taste is. We we got to have those greenhouse tomatoes, and we're always looking for varieties that are going to give us great flavor. But our three outdoor plantings of tomatoes is where a lot of the t- taste comes through. So we do we do both. We do you know we do season extension tomatoes, but we also have our outdoor tomatoes. Shay, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing. What would you say? I would say that I would tell myself, keep pushing. It's going to pay off. There's something big coming your way. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep being resilient. And Lorian, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? If I could go back in time, I would tell myself that in spite of the fact that there are a hundred tasks that need to be completed at any given time on the farm, whatever task that I am involved in or managing at that moment, to, to dig in and do it right, to learn about how to do it right so I can repeat that knowledge in the future, even though in the moment, it always seems like there's something else you're supposed to be doing. So you should get that task done as soon as possible to get on to the next thing. But the problem with that is that you end up that you, that you don't get the same amount of satisfaction that you get when you dig in and say, okay, I'm seeding these greens and I'm going to really focus on this. Even if it's, even if I feel like I'm spending too much time messing with the seeder, doing all of these adjustments, making sure the depth is just right, stop, do it again, make sure the depth is just right, because that will pay off in the future. I always have this this impatience of I'm, you know, the farm is drowning, I've got to get on to the next thing. I would tell myself, it's going to pay off for you to learn how to do that thing right and teach someone else how to do that thing right than to get three things done that you think you need to get done dig into this one task and do a great job at it because that's going that knowledge is going to pay off later on. Lorian and Shay, thank you so much for being on the farmer to farmer podcast today. Thank you Chris, for the opportunity. Yeah, really, really an honor. Thank you so much for having us on. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 162 of the farmer to farmer podcast, you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Blue Moon. That's B-L-U-E-M-O-O-N. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America. And by Osborne Quality Seeds, a dedicated partner for growers. Visit OsborneSeed.com for high-quality seed, industry-leading customer service, and fast order fulfillment. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your email inbox by signing up for my newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, When you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. If you would like to support the show directly, you can go to -to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate and sign up for a monthly or a one-time donation. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world, and I'd love to have your help. Finally, and this is another way you can help, right? Please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com and I will do my best to get them on the show. 
Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.